I want I want to play this clip to you. Did you ever have any interactions with uh, MLK or Malcolm X? Yes, I did. I uh, met Dr. King. In fact, I, he came to. I lived. I did my civil rights work in Westchester, Pennsylvania. That's the home of Baird Rustin. And so Rustin would bring Dr. King to town to bring the media. Then they would focus on our local issues. And w- you met him face to face. Oh yeah. yeah and and what a, was it like a, when you met oh, Dr. King? Just a wonderful experience. He was the one who said that uh, we must reach down into the deep, dark regions of our soul and sign and ink our own Emancipation Proclamation. Malcolm X said the same thing. He said, our destiny is never determined by what an oppressor does or does not do. He said, our our, our destiny is determined by what we do. Frederick Douglass said the same thing. But, but But those messages are being spun today. They're not... You know, these are two heroes to two different sects of the African American community. Sometimes, and some the same, but it's it's a, it's 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 spun in a different way, where it's still coming more from the victimhood mentality. It's coming more from the entitled mentality, not coming from the fact that we can stand up and do something about it. I want to play this clip to you by Malcolm X. It's just audio. The the video isn't out there. It's just purely audio, and I want to get your thoughts on this. Go ahead and play this. The white liberal differs from the white conservative only in one way. The liberal is more deceitful, more hypocritical than the conservative. Both want power, but the white liberal is the one who has perfected the art of posing as the Negro's friend and benefactor. And by winning the friendship and support of the Negro, the white liberal is able to use the Negro as a pawn or a weapon in this political football game that is constantly raging between the white liberals and the white conservatives. The American Negro is nothing but a political football, and the white liberals control this ball through tricks or tokenism, false promises of integration and civil rights. In this game of deceiving and using the American Negro, the white liberals have complete cooperation of the Negro civil rights leader who sell our people out for a few crumbs of token recognition, token gains, token progress. Now, when you hear this, this speech is given in the 60s, maybe late 50s and and 60s, because he he died, I want to say, February of uh, 1965. MLK died, uh, uh, Dr. King died April 4th of 68, right? So... This message is being given at a time where it's like, wait a minute, were white liberals the same then as they are today? Have they been at it for this long of a time where even Malcolm X said this? How do you process what Malcolm X, Malcolm X just said in this message? I totally agree, and it's been the foundation of everything that I have done since then. That's what drove me. I go further by saying that many of the black elected officials and others commit treason treason against their own people by using race to deflect attention away from their own failures. In, in Baltimore, when Freddie Gray was killed, that's when, to, to deflect attention away from why are blacks failing in school systems and at, in, in cities run by their own people for the past 50 years? If racism were the issue, then tell me why are they failing? And, but the answer that they give is, well, the police are agents of white supremacy. There's always a racial deflection that prevents them from taking responsibility of why they are running their systems. But, but many of them are hypocrites because they don't live by the same rules. Eleanor Holmes Norton, Jesse Jackson Jr., all of them sent their children to private schools in Washington while opposing school choice for poor black people. So you have this contradiction, but race really is being used as a shield and a sword, a shield to deflect attention away from their failure to address problems that were promised by the civil rights movement. How can you manipulate for this long, though? One may ask, you know, how can you manipulate? 2012, 93% of African Americans voted Democrat. 2016, 89% of African Americans voted Democrat. 2020, 87%. So 93, 89 87, voted Democrat. M, you know, Malcolm X said this at the year that he said, this is 60-something years. How can you manipulate an entire voting block, an entire community for this many decades? Because race is a very emotional, deeply emotional issue. 
It's like the state of Israel is to Jews. It's an emotional issue like abortion is to the, to, to the, the right to life. And, and, and so it, it is a deeply, and they know it, and they do manipulate it uh, that long. But also it's because Republicans have not been competitive either. When they were, they were successful. Look at Dick Reardon in, Cal, in, in, in L.A. He was the first Republican mayor in 35 years. How did he do that? Dick Reardon planted charitably two years before he harvested politically. He went to the low-income Hispanic community and said, what is it that you need to rebuild your community? And he brought some of his friends to the table, and they built a a state-of-the-art facility so so that those communities could engage in the after-school activities to teach English. It was only after he planted charitably that those liberal Democratic leaders embraced Dick Reardon and he became the first Republican mayor in 35 years. And when he got reelected by 60 percent of the demographic, uh, DeSantis in 2018 got elected because of the black vote. He ran against uh, Mm Gillum, right? Mm -hmm. Andrew Gillum. Andrew Gillum. But DeSantis only won by 32,000 votes because 100,000 low-income black parents voted because of his position on choice and education. They voted for him, even though Barack Obama and Oprah Winfrey was brought in to campaign for Gillum. So you have 100,000 blacks voting against Obama and voting against Oprah to elect Mm -hmm. because they made a decision based upon the content of the issue. And not enough Republicans did what the Santis did. And and when they do, I think they will be competitive. But apathy is what's keeping blacks. uh, Also, if you look in some of those high crime neighborhoods, in the mayor's race, only 8 to 10 percent of the people vote because there's just such a deep apathy in those communities. But low-income blacks are sleeping giants. They're going to wake up one day soon. Low-income blacks, blacks are going to wake up one day. Wake up and realize how they're being pimped, how they're being used. The, What's the tipping point? What needs to happen for them to wake up? I it's think been the, 60 violence, years. The, the, the violence that is, is, is you're seeing now, a lot of unrest. 80% of black Americans polled do not support defend the police. Mm-hmm. 80%. But you won't know that by looking at the media. You know, that and, and so and 60 percent of blacks do not believe that racial discrimination is the biggest barrier to their flourishing. And so the challenge that we have is to and what we're doing at the Woodson Center is giving voice to those to, to those people. We have about um, a couple thousand women uh, who are voices of Black Mothers United. These are women, moms who lost children to urban violence. They're coming, the leading cause of death for black kids is homicide. In Silicon Valley, it's suicide with among teenagers. Mm-hmm. And in Appalachia, is prescription drugs. Well, the Woodson Center brought together representatives from those three communities. We call it the Mother's Consortium. And, and, we, and it was just common ground there. We were united. And so what we must do is we must deracialize race. But it's not enough to talk about what you're against. You got to talk about what you're for. We should be for the saving of our children's lives. And so, what we're doing at the Woodson Center is mobilizing mothers from those three communities to come together and, and say that we must do everything we can to fill the hole that's in the hearts of our children that causes them to devalue their life to the point where they're willing to take their own or take someone else's. It's different sides of the same coin. So did, did you find out what the reasoning was for homicide, for suicide, and for prescription drugs? Like what's yes, the reason? Emptiness. When, emptiness. When, emptiness. Emptiness. When yeah. you keep telling, when you, they also, when you keep broadcasting to people that they live in a country that despises them, particularly the low-income blacks, that you live in a country that despises you, like the 1619 Project said, that racism defines all whites are villains and, and, and victimizers and they're privileged. That message 
gets communicated to blacks that perhaps the reason that this is happening is because they are unworthy. So the, so the message of unworthiness comes from the very people who are supposed to be social justice warriors. And, and you say to a child, in a white child, that you, you're, you're devalued because you're privileged and, and you are an oppressor. That kind of, th those are really dangerous messages that we're sending to our children when we keep saying to them that they live in a country that despises them because they're white and, 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 and derides them because they're black. I mean, that's a, that's a very poisonous message. And that's why at the Woodson Center, we're doing everything we can to mobilize that consensus among the people suffering the problem. So if you like this clip and you want to watch another one, click right here. And if you want to watch the entire podcast, click right here.